Happy uh, Mother's Day, everybody. Um, happy uh, Samaritan uh, Woman Sunday. It's a very, very blessed uh, time, and uh, I'm very, very happy that we all can be together. Um, we are living, of course, in uh, wonderful days of the Holy 50 Days, which are considered the most joyous, uh, most happy uh, days of the calendar of the year. And um, basically, um, the church sets for us um, the, what it really means to live in the resurrection. We all experience uh, uh, being at the foot of the cross during Good Friday. We all uh, live together the Lord's resurrection on uh, the Feast of the Resurrection. And now the church puts to us what this life on earth would look like uh, after the resurrection. The first thing that is needed for this new life, uh, uh, which is really what a resurrection is, a resurrection is new life after death. So we are actually living the first resurrection. We as Christians are very, very blessed because we have two resurrections. We have this resurrection now here on earth, which we live in our Lord Jesus Christ, and he is resurrected, we are resurrected. And then we have a second resurrection where after his second coming, we will be raised with him again. And then this is, will be the second resurrection and the final resurrection where we live with him eternally. But we have a, a very amazing blessing of this first resurrection. Um, and, this, and the church sets for us, what does that look like? And uh, it depends on faith. So we have to have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ to be able to live in this first resurrection. So this is why the church puts to us the Thomas Sunday at the very beginning of the Holy 50 Days. So it's telling us this life in Jesus Christ is dependent on our faith in him. And so this is the foundation of this First, our first resurrection. And then uh, to continue on this way, we need the, the bread of life. We need him. We need to partake of him. And we need to talk about the Eucharist and how that is uh, actually the uh, Christ himself and how he offered himself for us. And then thirdly, the church talks to us about living water. And the living water is the Holy Spirit. Um, and Jesus Christ himself, uh, when he was talking uh, at, during a feast of the Jews, he stood up on the last day of the feast and he says this, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, so this is the faith, that's the first thing. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So we have the faith, we have the bread of life, and now we have, this is the third part of this life of the resurrection, this new life after death. And then St. John, the, uh, the evangelist, explains what Jesus Christ placed by this living water. And he says, he spoke concerning the spirit. So a, a, a main ingredient or a main part of the second, uh, of this uh, new life, Again, or the first resurrection is the Holy Spirit. And we have the Holy Spirit after Pentecost. We receive the Holy Spirit and he dwells in us. And then this spirit lives in us and he gives us direction and he encourages us, lifts us up, gives us discernment between good and evil, uh, helps us to understand the, the scriptures and opens our minds to, uh, to what our Lord Jesus Christ is saying. What I'd like to focus on today is the relationship of the Samaritan woman and what our Lord Jesus Christ told her. And I think this is the key for us today. Our Lord Jesus Christ met the woman. He met, went out of his way to see the woman. He said, I had need to go through Samaria. Samaria. He, met, he met her at the heat of the day where nobody else would come out and the heat of the day. And he had this amazing encounter with her. And he talked to her um, about, uh, give me, he asked her, give me a drink. And he said, and she said, like, how is it that you talk to me as a, a, a Samaritan? For Jews have no um, dealing with Samaritans. He talked to her about the, 
water that he can give her. And he said, those who drink of this water will never thirst, but those who drink of the, this water from the well will always thirst. And this is the key here for us today, especially on Mother's Day, is how this example of an, an, a wonderful woman, a humble woman, responded to our Lord Jesus Christ. She said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst. What an amazing response. Um, what if all of us had the same response, the same feeling? Lord, give me this water. Give me your Holy Spirit. Give me what you you have. I want this uh, the spring that is always in, inside of me, that always is overflowing. And this is the beauty of the Samaritan woman. Now, of course, we don't know much about the Samaritan woman except what is written in the Gospel according to St. John. But historians in the early uh, church started to gather stories that were said about uh, the Samaritan woman and they wrote it down. In some of the Greek sermons of the day, she's actually mentioned, and she is, she is mentioned as an apostle and as a disciple and as a missionary and as a preacher. And some uh, preachers at the time uh, were putting her even a little higher than the disciples because of the amount of work and amount of converts that she had won for our Lord Jesus Christ. The history uh, and the tradition of, uh, of the churches tells us that she was um, baptized on the day of Pentecost. So as St. Peter preached, and all the people were gathered, she and five of her sister were baptized. So she didn't just come alone, but she came with five. So this was her maybe her second missionary journey. Her first missionary journey is actually mentioned in the gospel that we read today, where she went to the villagers and said, hey, come, be a man that told me everything that I have done. Can he be the, the one? Can he be the Messiah? This was considered maybe her first missionary service. Then the second one was to her own sisters, and then she was baptized, and she took on the name of Fotini. Fotini means the enlightened one. She had two sons, um, and this is also why I thought maybe she would be a good example for us on Mother's Day, because um, she wasn't a, a single person that just decided to uh, you know, follow Christ at no cost, but the, there was a cost for her because she had a family. She had two sons, uh, Cotinus and Joseph. Um, and so she, in, in all these efforts that she did, these, these brave missionary trips with this, uh, of Christ, um, teaching Christians, she had to consider, well, what about my kids? What about my sons? Uh, what kind of conditions are they going to live in? What kind of, how are they going to travel around? Uh, how are they going to eat? How are they going to study? How are they going to do this and that? All these things that mothers think of. But she did not let those things weigh her down. But she put their uh, spiritual priorities first. How um, she uh, would be an example for them in following Christ so that they can also follow her. She went all over the the world around her. Um, and uh, she went uh, as, as in many different places. I think it's mentioned that she went to Carthage, Carthage in Africa and many different parts of Asia. Um, and she preached the Lord Jesus Christ. This caused a stir. This caused her some uh, you know, notoriety for her. And then Emperor Nero heard about her. So he, when she was in Africa, he ordered her to be arrested and to brought she found out, and so she went to him before she got arrested, and she appeared to, in front of him with her five sisters and her younger son, Joseph. And uh, Emperor Nero um, asked her, are you ready to die for this Nazarene? And uh, he, she said, yes, me and my all those with me are, uh, and re are ready. She not just had her sister, but she also had her friends with her, many, many people, a big group. And then he said, well, why are you here? And she said, well, I'm here to try to uh, tell you about our, my Lord Jesus Christ that you might also believe. So here is this tyrant 
this half mad man, this Quincy guy, and he had already set a, a huge precedent in killing all as many Christians as he could find. He sent his soldiers out to kill and destroy any Christians they would they would find. And then she went goes to him voluntarily and stands before him and tries to convert him to Christianity. I just wanted to um, let us think about that for a minute. How brave she was. How um, how how amazing that effort was to go to the one who the murderer and the killer of Christians and stand before him and say, hey, how about you? You know, what do you think about Jesus? Who is Jesus? How have you heard? Let me tell you what I know about uh, my Lord and Savior. So this is what this was Saint Fortin. Um, of course, he didn't buy it. Um, he didn't. Uh, he was intent on killing her and killing uh, all those who were with her, or at least um, trying to uh, convert them or to get them to deny uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So he ordered them to be tortured, um, and he tortured them severely. It is said that the um, torturers turned. <laughs> so they would go around and beating St. Fotini and all that were, who were with her, and then they would get tired. So they had one hour shifts. <laughs> one torture would take an hour and beat them severely. And then another hour, another one, and so they they were, you know, the the uh, the torturers had breaks, but of course those being tortured just kept getting tortured. That didn't work. So as the emperor Nero tried to entice her, he uh, uh, put her uh, put her and her sisters on on these big golden chairs. They call them thrones, um, and um, they put a golden table in front of them with all kinds of uh, jewels, all kinds of gold, all kinds of beautiful dresses, all kinds of beautiful makeup, all kinds of perfume, you know, all the things that you know young women or if uh, any woman would uh, you know love. You know, it's just like a, a father. You know, they would go and and just enjoy all these perfumes and gold and jewelry, and and this would be their life. This is basically what he was telling them. This is could, this could be you. You can come here and you can live in the mansion. You can have all these gold. You can have a spa day every day. Um, but it didn't work. <laughs> Saint Fotini, of course, was uh, you know had her direction. She had her purpose, and this didn't work. So Nero tried another way, and he tried to send his daughter um, Domina, I believe it was her name, yes, uh, and ten slaves. Sorry, 100 slaves. They sent, uh, they tried to also entice her with showing her like how the, the women in the palace live. Um, but that didn't work. As a matter of fact, the St. Fotini ended up converting uh, Domina and all the 100 slaves. Uh, and they were baptized. This, of course, infuriated the emperor and he tried to burn them. So he set them in. The furnace for seven days and left them in there with the heat cranked up as high as it can go. And at the end of seven days, they opened the furnace and no, no harm to St. Fotini or anybody was with her. Um, her sons were actually with her. Joseph uh, was went with her initially from Africa to Rome, um, but uh, uh, um, but then her, her older son, Fotinus, joined them later, uh, according to what the story implies. Um, after the fire didn't work, they offered, uh, they gave them poison. So St. Fotini said, let me take the poison first. And she took the poison and nothing happened to her. And then all those with, with, with her, her sisters, her sons, all of her friends took the poison and nothing enticed them either. They tried. They imprisoned them for three years, and they continued to torture her and uh, and, and them, and nothing made them budge. Um, they gave them the worst living conditions uh, ever, but nothing. Uh, it is said that their cell or their prison became like a house of God, where there is constant praising, with constant worship, and this tells us that as Christians, we have that. Ability. We have that power in that no matter which situation we are in, which you know condition we're in, we can make wherever we are to be the house of God through our 
um, own um, spiritual efforts, our own prayers, our singing, our joy. And it's said that many of the, like the stories of the saints, many of the jailers themselves and their families were also converted to Christ because they saw that joy uh, uh, that was in them. Finally, the emperor gives up and then he does not kill her, but he kills all her friends and her two sons. Um, and of course, initially she's joyful for them, she's happy for them, but she's sad for herself. She is uh, kind of uh, brokenhearted. She doesn't have them anymore. And she prays to God that, you know, she feels like that's enough. Her mission is done. And if he wills, that she's ready to, to go to him. So she prays. And then on one of the nights, the Lord Jesus Christ appears to her and makes the sign of the cross for, for her three times. And uh, she takes that as that she has heard her prayers. And a few days later, she is able to deliver up her soul uh, into his hand. It's a wonderful, amazing, beautiful story um, that tells us the caliber of this woman that our Lord Jesus Christ met at the well. And to what extent she went through. And the major change from before the well to after the well. Um, but the question I want us to ask ourselves and think about it just for a few minutes is what is the secret sauce of her life? What was it that allowed this to be to happen? What allowed her to be this successful in her missionary service and in her life and leading her children and leading her sisters and leading her friends? And the key verse is actually from our Lord Jesus Christ. And we heard it today in the uh, gospel according to John chapter 4, verse 10. It says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given, um, given living water. So our Lord Jesus Christ says the secret sauce, says the, the secret here. If you knew the gift of God, so she knew the gift of God. She understood the gift of God. She believed, she asked, she received. And, and a lot of times, people who don't know God himself, our Lord Jesus Christ himself, then none of the other stuff can follow. And so this is, this is the key for us. The rich young man, for example, when our Lord Jesus Christ uh, talked to him, and he says, uh, take all you have, give, sell it and give it to the poor and come follow me. He struggled with that. Why did he struggle with that? Maybe he didn't really know who was talking to him. If he had known that the one that was talking to him is the kings of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of all creation, then what difference does it make? Why not? Him. Why not give up everything for him? So to know him, to know the gift that he has and the gifts that he gives us is, is, the, is the secret to be going from A to Z. That St. Peter and the disciple says, Lord, look, we have given all things so we can follow you. Where can we, where can we go? You have the uh, keys to eternal life. Where can we turn? So they, they understood. Of course, they struggled sometimes, but they knew. So the key for us is how do we know or how do we keep knowing? Um, and this ties in with the Pauline epistle that we read today. It says, if we were raised with Christ, so this is the first resurrection, if we are raised with him, see those things which are above uh, where Christ is sitting on the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. So then, if we are in this second resurrection, sorry, in this first resurrection, then the things that are above are the, the focus, and the things that here on earth are, are, are secondary. The things on this earth were never, ever, ever meant to satisfy the human soul. Um, Solomon, in all his glory, he had the biggest feasts. He had the biggest tables. He had the most uh, outrageous palaces, the fanciest clothes, um, all you know kinds of people around uh, surrounding him and, and praising him. 
But at the very end, he says, vanity of vanity. All is vanity. So Solomon, who had all these things of the, in the, of the earth, uh, realized that those things don't satisfy. The world is given to us so that we can use its resources. We can take care of it. Even in Genesis, it says subdue it. Uh, but it's not to fulfill us. The only thing that can fulfill us is our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, St. Fotini realized this. She knew. Before the well, she had five husbands. But those five husbands never fulfilled her, never satisfied her, never made her feel complete, never made her feel fulfilled. But after the well, she was fulfilled. She was no longer thirsty. She, she, she was filled with the gift that the Lord Jesus Christ gives her. And we can see that in, in her life. So we put her in front of us. And this is why I love this, this verse very much. Basil the Great talks about a painter. And the painter is creating a painting from a picture. Um, or even from a person sitting in front of him. But it, he draws a little bit and then looks at the painting. And then draw, draws some more. Look through the picture and draw some more. Look through the picture and draw some more. So he's saying our life has to be like this. We look at the saint, Saint Cotini, and we paint in our life a little bit more. We look at the mother of God and paint in our life a little bit more. We look at the of Arimi and we paint in our life a little bit more. And this is how we live as Christians. We, we look at these examples of the saint and then we create our own painting. The painting that we create is not an exact replica of the initial painting, but is our own interpretation. But it has some of the characters and some of the beauty and some of the depth of the, of the original. Um, so we honor moms because of this great uh, image that they give us. And I thought maybe we can have some practical, uh, zero cost uh, ways of uh, honoring them. First I, uh, is to be successful uh, in our own life. Nothing makes a mother happier than to see her children successful. And successful in their work, successful in their school, successful in their dealings with others, successful also in their spiritual life. And working our, out our salvation and being close to our Lord would make our mothers extremely happy and glad in their heart. Um, Fotini must have experienced that. She had her two sons and they gave up their life before she did. And that must have, and that did make her feel like she finished her, her service, her, she finished her job. Once our moms feel that we are okay, we are successful in our own, in our life in every way, then they are comforted. So this is one way we can honor them, is by being good in, in our life. The second thing is to acknowledge them verbally, say thank you. You did a lot. You cried for us. You labored for us. You toiled for us. You stood up nights for us. You cooked a gazillion meals for us. And you did so much for us. We acknowledge those things for our, our mothers. Thirdly, we listen to them. Moms have a lot of depth of stories and things that they've experienced and things that have made them who they are now and, and made their lives the way they are now. So we, we, we listen those, to those stories, not grudgingly, but because we want to know the, these real life lessons that they have. And by listening to them, then that makes them happy and that honors them. That leads us to the fourth point, which is to take interest in their life. What are their lives like? What do they do? What are they, how are they spending their time? And the more we take interest in their life, then that's the more we are honoring them. And finally, we can honor them by loving their children and their grandchildren. So if you are a husband, then love your wife's children. If you are a son, then love your wife, uh, your mom's other children, your siblings. Uh, if you are um, also a husband, then love uh, 
um, your um, your children because that uh, honors your their grandmother. So um, by honoring the children of the mother, then we show honor to them. May God bless you all. May God bless us and help us to have a wonderful Mother's Day. May God be with you and glory be to God forever.